everybody. Welcome back to this issue of Staffing Monthly, where we're trying to solve the biggest problem facing the staffing industry today, and that is the great candidate shortage. And we're just trying to figure out where everybody is. And as you know, I've scoured the globe to find thought leaders and experts to help us answer this question. And I cannot tell you how humbled and honored I am to have this guest here with us today. But Lou Adler is somebody that has been literally in the staffing industry longer than I've been alive. He yeah, has don't, trained. Don't let's not go there. Come on. Now, <laughs> now we're going to stop this conversation. Is that we're quick. done? We're done? Is that it? Just edit it out right there. But I said, but Lou is, he is, in my opinion, he is recruiter trainer royalty. And I think that not only has he had a career in this industry, but he actually found his calling, you know, a little over 20 years ago by founding his own company and teaching recruiting professionals, hiring managers, staffing professionals, really innovative ways to source and recruit better talent. So there really is nobody better out there today to tell us how do we get more and better talent than Lou Adler. And Lou, I am truly humbled and grateful to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Happy to be here. And it's actually been 40 years that I started, actually 44 years started as a recruiter, and I got 10 years prior to that in industry. So uh, we got to, we'll catch up real quickly though. That's great. So there's probably not much you haven't seen. So this is uh, this is going to be fantastic. So again, this is the pressing one. Our industry is getting crushed. They're, they don't need more orders. They don't need more clients. They they need more candidates. They've got more recs than they can handle. And every time I talk to a recruiter, they're like, Dan, how do I get more and better candidates? So I said, you know what? I'm going to go talk to some people smarter than me. So Lou, that's where I'm posing a question to you. How do we get more and better candidates in today's marketplace? Okay, so I'm going to have to give you some history before I get you to the solution. All right. My first job, literally first job, and I told you earlier before we started the recording, was a engineer. Uh, and I have an undergraduate degree in uh, systems engineering. And my first job was working on a nuclear missile project. Wow. And it was actually, I had to come up with, how, when, at what point in time do you blow this missile up if it's off course? <laughs> uh, that was my first job as a real engineer. And the day I started, my boss gave me this little thing he wrote down. He said, Lou, I'm going to ask you two questions. And I don't want the answer now. I want the answer on Thursday when I take you out to lunch. Question one was, why does E equals MC squared? And why can't you push on a rope? And I said to the boss, I can't remember his name now. I think I probably, if I thought about it, I probably could. But I said, well, I can answer those questions right now. I don't need to have me. No, I want you to meet everybody and answer the question. So part of the thing was to meet the team. And it was about 20 or 30 engineers on the team. Uh, and they knew what was the question was and that I was going to meet with the uh, manager uh, later that week. But what I learned was two things in that. Number one, there's a science to a lot of stuff. And that was the E equals MC squared. Yeah. But more important there was a reality to the world and that was you can't push on a rope. And these engineers I was working with were the people who designed how to build this nuclear missile. But when they wanted to make a change and that was what systems engineers do, they, they propagate a key to change the design of one circuit. What does that do to the whole system? Is it accurate, more accurate, more reliable, less accurate. And the idea of you can't push on a rope. And this took me, although conceptually I understood it in three days, took me years to really figure it out is everybody has an opinion on how things have to be done. But if you don't look at the end game to figure out what's the best way to optimize everybody's individual ideas, you'll never get there. And that's yeah. hard. So now I go to, so that was my first step in understanding hiring and business processes. Today, there are too many processes of thinking people, no, it's not about finding good talent. I can get you good talent for any single job in the world. Uh, and, so it's now noon at one o'clock in California. By the afternoon, I'll have 20 candidates. Not one of them will take the job, though, because the solution is, will this person take the job and will he or she be successful for the long term? So you got to think the end in mind, which is I want to hire a great person who will accept the job and will be there a year from now. And if you don't have that in your mind, you're not going to get there. Now, yeah. that's step one. Now, I'm going to go four years later to that meeting. I guess it was four years after I had that meeting, but it was probably three years later. Um, I got an MBA after I got my engineering degree. And my first job was a senior financial an or financial analyst working for the 35th largest company at the corporate headquarters of the 35th largest company in the world, which was a pretty cool job to have because I 
And it was only because I did real well as an N MBA and I had an engineer in degree. So that was kind of an unusual combo at the time. I guess not so unusual now. But I was in one meeting where I was told, do not say a single word. All you're going to do is listen and flip over the slides. In those days when you did, <laughs> it wasn't PowerPoint, you had little plastic viewfoils. And all my job was to take that plastic view viewfoil, put it in an overhead projector, and shut up and don't say a word. And don't make <laughs> a mistake. And it's all I had to do. And I was so scared, so scared. I mean, the chairman of the board, the name of the guy was on the company name and et cetera, et cetera. But wow. I learned, so it was a pretty cool experience. However, the CFO of the company, who was a Ford whiz kid at the time, but came over to this company, uh, was taught. And I what there was a group president, multi-billion dollar group, presenting his business plan for the next year to this. And I was just there to listen, which is pretty cool when you're 25 or 26 to listen to that. Absolutely. But I'm sweating and I can't make a mistake flipping over plastic slides. I mean, this is just <laughs> the only job I had. But then after about an hour, the CFO stood up and said, this meeting's over. He said, strategy drives tactics. And all you're telling me is a bunch of tactics and you got a crappy strategy. I want to hear the strategy for an hour and then the tactics. Come back next week and we'll do it again. And he walks out. And the rest of the, I mean, this is like senior executives talking to a, a, a group president and saying strategy drives tactics. So let me take you those two ideas and answer your question. The reason can companies can't find good people is they got the wrong strategy and they're trying to push on a rope and it can't be done. If uh -huh. you want to hire a great person, and let me just say the demand for talent, I think you would agree and everybody you talk to, the demand for great talent is greater than supply. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that's clearly true. Well, what they're using is a process designed to weed out the weak. Well, if the best people... And, and I'm going to contend that strategy decision is fundamentally flawed. If you want to hire a great person, you have to attract the best, not weed out the weak. So if you post a boring job that a best candidate would look at and say, I don't like this job, you've got a stupid strategy. And I'm going to say, if you post individual jobs and expect to attract the best, you've got the wrong strategy. If your strategy, if the postings describe opportunities that list skills, experience, and competencies and make force people to apply, you have the wrong strategy. You will never attract a great person. What I do when I take a job, and I did one, I'll give you my first assignment 44 years ago, and another one I did last week, where I helped the CEO of a company last week. First one was a plant manager. This is after 10 years in industry. And the only reason I became a recruiter is because I got pissed. I was running a company by the time I was 32, 300 people. And I was on a good corporate track, no question about it. I hated the group president, hated him. <laughs> he came back every other week. He came down and said I was a miserable SOB. And I said he was a miserable SOB. And Every other month I quit. So quit four times in one year. Then I gave him a six month notice and I'm out of here. Obviously other people in the company tried to convince me to stay. And I said, now I, and if that guy's here, I'm not going to, I don't want to even be associated with him. Um, and it was pretty clear that we did not get along. Um, <laughs> and I was a young kid. So let's say this, I, I was not perfect by any means because I'm pretty much in your face. Like I'm telling you today. Um, then I was back that way too. Um, Regardless, so the first project I had, and this is the key, the key to your answer is it was in January of 1978. So a long time ago, my first search assignment it was a plant manager making automotive components. Uh, president of the company, and I had six months to get ready for this. So he said, I'm looking for a plant manager, has to have 10 to 15 years experience, have an engineering degree, come to these kind of schools, good attitude, aggressive, assertive, good community, yada, 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 all the stuff that you right, see. Yeah. And I said, Mike, that's not a job description. That's a person description. The job description doesn't have skills, experience, and competencies. That's what a person has. Let's mm -hmm. put this job description in the parking lot and tell me what you want the person to do. And he said, good question. I want the person to turn around a plant. I said, let's walk through the plant and see what's wrong, wrong with it. And I had no problem doing it because I had been to so many manufacturing plants. Right. The plant was an underperforming manufacturing plant. Uh, you could just see scrap of material is too high. You could see the processing was inefficient or enough controls on the process. Some people were working hard. Some people weren't in all. I could say they were moving raw material from plant part A, part B, part C was all crossing over. Scrap was on the floor. The floor was a clean, dirty plant. I mean, you could just, so seven things we looked at in the plant in an hour said, this is all junk. We got to clean everything up here. Um, and I said, that's what we'll find. Somebody who can do that work. That was the key. I define work as a series of performance objectives, and that opens a pool to everybody. 
He said, well, how much experience does a person need to have to do this work? And I don't know enough to do the work. Yeah. Five years, I mean, I don't know how much, 20 years, five. I don't know if they need a degree or not. They need to be able to do that work. Maybe they do need a degree. I don't want to argue that part. But the point is the outcome is clean turning around that plant. And if they can't do that, they don't deserve the job. I don't care how many years experience they've got. And then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to market a list of stuff. I'm going to say, hey, I need someone to turn around a plant. You want to turn around a plant and you've done stuff that has this background. Let's talk. So I just focus. on. So my job postings are not, uh, or my job descriptions aren't what I post. My postings are stories. I got to turn around a plan. I got to build this. I got to launch a new product line. If you want to chat about it, let's do it. So that was 44 years ago. I've done a thousand assignments since then. One last week. Now I don't do the search, but I help companies hire people. This was a CEO looking for someone to be a chief operating officer for a company that sells seed to, at, to farmers around the world. GMO seed, cotton, alfalfa, uh, corn, whatever the stuff they sell. Yeah. Um, he had the list of 20 things he wanted the person to do. I said, what do you want the person to do? This is the last week. <laughs> Steve, what do you want the person to do? You know, that's an interesting question. I want, uh, the board is telling me I've got to improve profit and reduce inventory. Well, you had $100 million of inventory uh, for a plant that's selling 150. You got way too much inventory. We got to cut that in half. So we got to have so many, and we got to set up a procurement system uh, to manage the inventory. And then uh, as a result of the pricing of that, uh, we got to have best just in time deliveries and we got to reduce pricing by three to 5%. And you'll make your objectives. That's what the person needs to do. I don't, they got to. And I got to sell seed to farmers around the world. So the point is when you focus, so the talent shortage is number one, you got a bad strategy and you're posting stupid jobs that the best people don't want to do. And yet there'll still be a talent shortage. I don't want to minimize that. But if you're going about trying to find people who are great people who will apply to a job, uh, focusing on short-term criteria, you're not going to get the best people. So you got to start with a new strategy, Define jobs differently. Look for people who are competent and motivated to do that work and would see the jobs or career move. At least that's a start to solve that, to answer your question. So that makes a lot of sense. And I, I've seen that issue. So just to just to drive the point home for, for our viewers to clarify, really, when they're just copy and pasting job descriptions and putting it on Indeed or ZipRecruiter or whatnot, they're essentially just almost too narrow focused and they're really not focused on the root thing of what they need done. It doesn't really describe the, the performance objectives of what they're looking for. So by default, their actual tactic is possibly screening out the right people. So they're almost self-inflicting a candidate, an additional candidate shortage on them just because of the way they're kind of just copying and pasting their job descriptions on the job boards. I mean, let's just be real quick. The job boards are not companies. They're in the business to sell job postings. That's right. They're in a business that could turn. They're delighted by the great resignation. So yeah. Companies got to post more. So their do, business is doing great. So if you look at the follow the money, the job posting isn't the criteria. But if you follow how do great people find jobs, I would say if you take 100 great people from professional level and above, so two to three years in business, accounting, engineering, marketing, sales, and above, if they're in the top third, they did not find a job through the posting. Two seventy five percent. They found it through someone they know. That's right. Oh, hey, you know, I get calls all the time. You know, somebody can do this. You know, somebody can do that. Or they went to a, a third party recruiter. They might even go to an agency that's got a deep network. You know, this agency, Robert Half has got good accounts. And I don't want to uh, malign them. There are certain agencies that have deep networks of good people and they would go to those people. But that agency has developed a deep network and can tap into strong people. Uh, I had a deep network of financial people and manufacturing people and had a deep Rolodex or deep database of names of good people. I can make a few few calls uh, pretty quickly and find candidates who are on the margin, kind of ready to think and open to talk. Um, so I just developed a, a lot of capability on the phone. So in my mind, you've got to shift to a high tech process to identify semifinalists, but uh, you've got to use your... Um, on the phone to get this high touch process and bring the hiring manager, recruiter, and candidate engaged very, very quickly. So then, where where does the agency go from there? Where does the recruiter go from there? If they if they retweak their strategy and they get more focused on just finding the right person, you know, and just saying, hey, instead of having a very detailed, over nuanced job description for plant manager, and say, I need someone that's going to turn this around, like they do that, where do they go next? How do they really get that candidate from? being attracted to them and talking to them to really placed and performing. 
Okay, so let me give you a story about a search assignment, which kind of describes it. I say only source semifinalists. A semifinalist or someone can do that work. They can't do the work. Forget about it. They just, uh, they probably are been recognized for doing that work real well. I call that the achiever pattern. I know that if they can do that work and have been recognized for doing it, they taught a class in internal audit of international manufacturing companies. Uh, they spoke at some conference uh, that was a critical conference in uh, quality control or finance or engineering. They presented some kind of white paper on how to uh, put project management teams together. If they've got some kind of skill set and uh, have done comparable work, then that's usually the title and a couple of keywords and a couple of achiever terms. I call that high probability the hiring manager would see the person. I only source 10 to 15 semifinalists at most. I then also find people would see their jobs or career move because you've got two decision makers here. You've got the hiring manager has to agree to see the person and you got the candidates agree to not only talk to you, but also uh, if like if the jobs or career move, high probability they'll accept an offer. So you got to pre-qualify those. And I think too many people just shotgunning, let's get candidates who are skilled and hopefully one sticks. Well, to me, that's a waste of time. Uh, if you, uh, So I find semi-finalists. So let me give you a story. I had an HR spot at VPHR for a significant size company in a very, I'm going to say, miserable, miserable, I don't want to make anybody feel bad, but it was in the Midwest and it was away from any major cities. It was, okay. It was, you, you could get there if you struggled from Chicago, could get there if you struggled from Detroit, you could get there if you struggled <laughs> from Indianapolis, uh, which you could probably triangulate and figure exactly where Yeah, it was. I was just thinking that. I was thinking about a globe in my yeah, mind. Right. Uh, and it was a VP. So I targeted companies in those three geographic areas who could do the work. They probably had a director and it was an HR VP spot. I had a director of uh, HR position for big companies and a lot of big companies in those areas. So I targeted that, identified 20 or 30 names that I got on LinkedIn, uh, which was easy to get the names. Then I wrote a story and I sent an email. I said, I've got this spot. It's a VP level spot. I need someone to turn to completely rebuild the HR infrastructure for a company that's going faster than the speed of light. Uh, I've been talking with the CEO. He's he nearly needs a strategic partner in this. We'll get him on the phone. We'll chat with him if you think this is an interesting story. Uh, and basically, it was a story. I said, if you've done it, don't even think of sending me a raise. I don't care. If you think you can do this, we'll put a half page write up of something you've done similar and we'll arrange a combo. And that's all I said. Sent it to 20 people, 12 responded overnight. Nice. Got the job. Sourcing. And I'm like, oh, not enough good people. No, you, you I mean, sales reps don't call every single possible customer up. They pre-qualify the customers. That's right. At least they should. I mean, they should be. Yeah, right. So I mean, think about when you have a job posting, 95% of the people are unqualified. 5% are semi-qualified. You'll talk to four, about 100 people. You talk to four or five, one of them might get the job. That's about the ratio uh, at best. But now you also have to have a system, number one, to screen out the five, but you also have a system to, to be nice to the 95 that didn't get the job. So you think about the cost of a job posting is much greater than the 200 to $300 for the posting. It's all the overhead associated with managing all that data. You need an ATS system. You have to have a candidate experience system. You've got to have this going back and forth. So you're spending a lot of money on overhead. I say, why? I'm going after 20 people. I'm going to be treat every one of them royally uh, because I got time to do it. And they're, I'm going to make the hiring manager talk to the candidate. I'm going to get all talk to all the candidates and they're going to be treated like God. Uh, and they should be. Uh, but one of them is going to take the job because it's a good career move, not just the biggest compensation package. So there's more to it than that. But the idea is if you've got the right strategy to focus on how good people get jobs and what needs to be done to ensure they're not only competent and motivated uh, before and pre and post hire, but also uh, respond to your messages. I mean, that's part of the whole deal. You got to think this is why I say you can't push on a rope and you got to think the end. You got to think the whole system, not just great applicant tracking system doesn't do any good if the best people aren't applying. Uh, the great assessment. I've, I've been talking to PhDs. They're so excited about our assessment. They validate them all. I said, yeah, but what's the point if none of the no best people apply? Oh, it doesn't matter. This is a PhD. I've, I've got my PhD in this. But they don't think about it from the end goal of hiring a person who not only accepts the offer, but also is exceptional and stays after they're hired. That the end game is not 
the start date. The end game is at least a year later, and they're still uh, enjoy the. I call that win-win hiring. They're happy with the role. They're glad they're there. They're not going to leave. And the hiring managers are glad that person's there, and the company's glad, and they're going to promote and develop that person continually. That flies in the face of job boards because there are fewer postings. And it's, so the job true. boards don't agree to that. I've presented this to many job boards. No, no way we're going to do that. Kill our business model. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, smell more postings. You're right. I mean, that really is. You're spot on with that one. So let me let me push back because I I am I'm bought in. Everything you're saying, like I, I'm buying what you're selling here. And that's spot on. And I would say that's super appropriate for the, the top half of the organization, managers and up. But let's talk about not that plant manager. How do you apply this strategy and some of these better tactics that you shared to the guy on the floor, you know, the girl that's running the fork truck, the the person that's, you know, in the plant, but they're the unsung hero of the operation. How do you, how do you apply this to that? You may be more rank and file employee. Okay. So let's kind of be very clear. You said manager and above. Now I'm going to say any professional engineer, any professional, one or two year accountant, Fair. Um, one or two year engineer. Fair. So because if you want to hire the best, they all, they all think the same way. So the same process applies to any professional position from somebody with two years and above experience. That's a critical position. Now let's go to the rank. Let me give you a couple of stories. Yeah. Um, as I told the story earlier. So I had a situation with a huge insurance company. If I told you the name, you'd know the company. Uh, we had already done some project work with their sales team uh, using the same methodology and a group of uh, probably 70 or 80 um, hires in one year. And it turned out that everybody hired 70, 80% made quota in the first six months versus 20 to 30% using the old way. So they were convinced this was a good approach. And they didn't need, I wanted to really study at the micro level. They said, nah, <laughs> the sales manager bought in, they'll support us 100%. So it was pretty easy to get. Uh, we just mapped the sales process for selling and we found people who could do that work. But then the HRVP signed a contract uh, with the VP of training and some other people to do this for their call center. So this was the rank and file jobs of people. And this was 5,000 people in seven call centers around the country, um, which was pretty interesting. And it was a big contract for us because we had real, we had done similar work, but not identical work. But it was a big contract for us to do training. Um, and it was in, I think the headquarters for the Western region was in Los Angeles area because uh, I was I live in Southern California, so I knew I didn't have to fly there. But every but all the all the uh, managers and directors of these call centers were there in uh, I think it was San Fernando Valley somewhere, and we'd already signed a contract. So this was the launch of the program, uh, and it was the introduction of the program. VPHR was there, the director of training was there, and we're going to train this whole people on how to do this, hire these people in a call center, and at that moment. The head of the vice president of that group for the call centers of 5,000 people, I hired 2,000 a year or so, said, I don't think we really want to do this. What? Which was not good news because this was the day we were going to launch it. And they said, yeah, we don't. And everyone agreed. Yeah, we don't really think we need this. And this was like this was a strategy they planned to set the stage to kill this project. So it was not good news for any of We kind of all turned white. Wow. And, they, and then they made this statement. They said, we only have a 10% failure rate every year in our hiring process. We don't think we need a new one. That was their comment. So then I kind of thinking, how am I going to salvage this real time? Uh, Cause I didn't want to lose the contract and HRVP had mud on her face and all this kind of stuff. So I said, wait a second, I want to ask this question. Are you telling me of the 90% of the people who stay in this call center are equally the top third of that 90% are equally as productive as the bottom third. They're all exactly the same. I said, oh, no, definitely not. I said, <laughs> what's the difference between the top third and the bottom third? He said, a top third is probably 50 to 100% more productive. I said, <laughs> in what areas? And they said, in terms of efficiency, productivity, and quality, et cetera, et cetera, fewer complaints. I said, so what if we showed you a program where we could show you how to hire the top third and not the bottom third? And they, was, they knew they lost. They knew they lost. They put their heads hey, down. What, what are they going to say to that? You they, know? they they just said, okay, you win, Adler. You won. So now the point being, no, now get to your question, Dan. Uh, you said, can you use it for the rank and file? And the issue is, I said, let's here's how I did it. I said, let's benchmark how the best people do that job. 
Why are they third, one third more productive? What do they do differently? What, and I said, you're all, you know these people. I want you to name the best people in your, in your group. Call them up if you have to. I want to know the names of the people. This is a full day program to launch it. We had names and they're all women, 95% women. And they're all, and I said, give me the demographic. How old are they? Why are they there? Um, oh, there's Doris, there's Sally, there was Mary, there was um, Juanita. I mean, whatever it was, I said, why are they better? What do they do differently? And we found traits that indicated they could do differently. Number one was a very structured environment. Number two, it was, uh, number one, a great, great comp and great pay. Uh, but it was the attention to detail, understanding how to handle four or five different calls at once, put them on cue so they had to balance different things. But then I said, what's the one single difference? And we had like 20 names on a board. I said, what's the common thread of all these people? And now not everybody knew everybody, but they all, we got these seven managers there. And they looked at it. And the one common thread was they showed up 100% of the time, 100% attendance. They could do the work, but if they didn't show up. Uh, and then people say, oh, wow, I agree. This woman could be perfect, but she's only there 95% of the time or this person. So that was the first, we benchmarked the job and created what, is a, what does success look like for the people who are the best performers? Then we said, well, how do we advertise this? So that was the sourcing piece. Different yeah. than what I defined you. It was still a higher volume approach. I said, why do these people like the job? Because it was just, the, as a ranking talk, nobody great wants, it's not a career move. I said, fine, but do, are there people here who stay year after year who produce at high levels? They said, absolutely. I said, tell me about these people. Why yeah. do they stay? Uh, and we learned. There was a demographic. Most of them had kids, good benefits, structured environment. They could, But they also, it was, maybe it was a classic work-life balance. The job was great. It met their needs. They all live within 10 to 15 miles of the office. They didn't get stuck in LA traffic or whatever traffic <laughs> it was. So we just had, <laughs> we just advertised those pieces. And that's what happened. And that's what we did. And we can do it for any job. We've done it factory jobs. We did it for warehouse jobs. We've done it for company selling yellow pages. So the idea is you got to benchmark the best. It's different. And then you got to talk to people and they say, why do great people like this job? Why do they stay year after year and, and continue to produce? So it's a different demographic. It's not someone who's career oriented, but someone who's um, uh, willing to uh, put a strong work ethic in and do an exceptional job. It, it makes a ton of sense. And I, I actually... Totally agree with that as well. I, I, I've taught some workshops on employee value proposition. I, I know in the sales part of an organization, they've got the unique value proposition and they do a lot of effort on trying to identify what, what value do they uniquely provide to their customers. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. money and effort put into marketing and advertising and sales to get that message perfectly crafted and out the door. But very few organizations actually spend that kind of time, effort, or resources to create the employee value proposition to find out why do employees choose yeah. to show up there every single day, you know? And I think the companies that really understand why employees choose them and, and come and show up to work every single day, and then those companies work to deliver on that and meet that, meet the, the, the I guess, the obligation or the responsibility they have to the employee to deliver that every single day, they're going to win. And they're, I think they're going to attract that top third of employees. And I, 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 I'm, I'm surprised that that we've been in this industry this long, you obviously much longer than me, but there's still people out there that are still kind of not grasping at that concept to just look internally and see what the top producers do and go find more of them. Right. Well, I think the other thing is in talking about the employee value proposition. So this is a story from 54 years ago, which is that first job on the nuclear missile program. Uh, and I learned it as I was talking to all these people, uh, that the job I described to you, because I had to meet these people who were engineers, they didn't like the job. They It was just a job to them. Uh, the reason they didn't like the job, this was a nuclear, this is the Minuteman nuclear missile project. They had all been on for the prior five or six or seven years on the lunar landing project. Same company, same work. That job in 1962 and 63 to 1968, they worked, they said, I, we worked. 24 seven. I didn't want to go home. I, I sometimes slept in the office. I, we love this job so much that uh, meeting Kennedy's goal, putting a man on the moon by the end of the decade. They did that. They just got transferred in the last year to this job because they had finished the design of the lunar excursion module. That's what they worked on. So that's what I also learned. The mission matters. They're exactly the same engineering work, exactly the same work. But the impact of that work, one was how do you explode a nuclear bomb accurately? Uh, on your enemy. The other one was putting a man on the moon. So I learned that the mission matters. So so we always ask when we take this 
Tell me what this person needs to do and why would a great person want this job? What's the impact of it? Is it internal that you learn something or is it something you give back? It, and it true, once it you true. understand that becomes part of the advertising and the messaging and your emails and your postings. Absolutely. It, it's truly amazing how much positive impact that has on retention. When you can actually directly show the impact that a person makes in their everyday job and the tangible outcome of that. Even for call center agents, you know, maybe selling insurance or dealing with insurance claims or people that, you know, are frustrated with their policy, whatever that is, if they understand the peace of mind and the benefit that insurance can truly provide people in sometimes the worst situations they're faced with in their life and they realize that they're the ones that are delivering that for them, that they're stewarding that, I think that it gives greater meaning to that mission. And I would I would agree that the mission does matter. Well, I think it was... Uh... Well, certainly in the mission, we said, let's, you know, you're the voice of our customer in this call center. I think that was part of the mission. But another story that comes to mind, this was about 10 or 15 years ago, and we just started doing our online training. And I guess it was 2005. So it had to be around that time frame. Uh, one woman was trying to find flight nurses, people who go in a helicopter, you know, and, and land. And I think it was up in Sacramento Community Hospital System. But it was an, our first one of the few online tra trainings we just did. And I know the program was in February because I remember she said, I said, what's your, what's your hiring challenge? Well, I've been posting a job since Thanksgiving and it's been three or four months. I got about 50, maybe 40 or 50 resumes, but nobody's really very good. And this was when they had a real nursing shortage. Mm. Well, I just asked the person, I said, why do people do that? I mean, I said, why do they do this? And she said, well, because they really get this. They're saving lives every day and every mission. I said, well, where does that say that in your posting? She said, it doesn't. What does it say? It says Sacramento Community Hospital System must have 10 years of this, must be this, yada, yada. I said, why don't you just put those words somewhere, maybe in a tagline, like flight nurses saving lives every day. That was, And I said, you use your own words, but something like that. Next, because we had a program that was four weeks every week they would come online. Uh I hear this blood. I said, did anybody have any luck? And I hear this blood curdling scream. Unbelievable in the background. I almost hear it today, 15, 17 years <laughs> later. She said, what happened? She said, I posted it on Monday. All I did was change it. Flight nurses saving lives every day. We got 12 responses. Four of them looked great. The next week, she said, I'm interviewing three people. The week after that, she said, we hired four people, two for the flight nurse program, two for the emergency room. And all she did was change the tagline, which captured the EVP. So part of it's marketing, but it's messaging to understand your audience, who your customer is. You don't just talk to everybody. You talk to people you want to hire and write in their words. That's right. And that's and really, in my opinion, these days, I think all of it's marketing because marketing is all about knowing exactly who you need to talk to. What is the message you need to share with that person? And what's the medium you need to share it to get them to take whatever action you're trying to inspire them to take? And you hit it. You hit it right on the head there, Lou. I. I got to tell you, I, I'm in awe. I, I am grateful for the wisdom that, that you've shared with us today. And I uh, I truly am. I, I know that I sat here and took notes and there's things that I know that I can actually Im improve upon myself and help me recruit better just from this. And I know our viewers are going to feel the same way. Is there is there a parting word or a message that you'd like to share? Because I've got one more story I'm going to ask you to tell before this. But is there is there a parting message you, you feel like our viewers should I hear? Think the parting message is, I think, I didn't know any of this stuff I'm telling you about. I didn't know how to interview. I didn't know how to source. I didn't know how uh, to close the deal. I learned that. What I, the key to being a good recruiter is the key to being a good sales rep of any product. You have to know your product because if you don't know your product, you smell and smoke and mirrors and hustle in the job. I, because of my unique experience before becoming a recruiter, engineer, manufacturing, cost accounting, uh, financial budgeting and planning, manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, I had done a lot of this kind of work. Yeah. So I had no problem talking to people, tell me about this job. Uh, but th So then when I talked to candidates, and I, did, I screwed up a lot, I didn't know the job, but once I learned the job, people, the candidates trusted me to understand what was going on. I wasn't an idiot. I wasn't just some paper pusher and hiring managers trusted me to say to do it. So I learned how to be better at all that stuff. But I learned that, hey, I'm selling someone's life. Uh, and if I don't know that job, it's all superficial. So I think the parting word is if you're selling a recruiter or you're hiring manager or you're a recruiter or sourcer, you better know that job or you're just 
um, you're just selling smoke and mirrors and you're never going to win. So the strategy is important, but the tactic is know the job inside out. So, in, so you sound convincing to both the hiring manager and the candidate. That's what I would say is the core of this whole process. I, I love it. I love it. And now, so I, I appreciate you sharing that. There's one story that I want you to share. I, I heard this in a message that you gave one time and it resonated with me because I'm also a believer that the human being is the most important element of any company. But I heard you make a comment about how one of your leaders at an organization told you to put everything else on hold and, and focus on hiring the right people. Do you, you know what I'm talking okay. about? Yeah, I, do. I know exactly that story. So it was actually the um, my first book, Hire With Your Head, it was the introduction. Um, and But I'll go back. My first management job was as a manager of capital budgeting uh, for an automotive manufacturing company in Detroit. Got relocated out of Southern California and went there. Uh, and I'm doing this real detailed project um, and it was due to the president and the CFO, some budgeting plan or something the next morning. Uh, my boss calls me about noon of that after that day, the day before, and says, Lou, uh, I'm over at the University of Michigan. Uh, we had 20 uh, MBAs who signed up to uh, interview uh, for today, and I only have room for four. You have to get over here right away and interview eight students for an MBA. And I never interviewed anybody. Huh. You got in you eight for this afternoon. Maybe it was not. I said, Chuck, I can't do it. I got this report that's due the next morning and I got to get it done. I will never get it done if I got to go to University of Michigan, which was uh, we were outside of Detroit, but it was still uh, 30, 40 miles away. Yeah. Uh, and, and I had never interviewed a candidate before. He said, get your profanity over here. We'll do it. We'll get the report done somehow. So I drove over there. And I think, now actually, his words were, there's nothing more important than hiring great talent. Everything else can wait. That's get right. Get your profanity laden over here, and we'll get it done. Went over there. I interviewed the first candidate with my boss, Chuck, at the time. Uh, he said, you're on your own. you got seven more candidates to interview. And these are the half-hour college interviews. I went through the same exact pitch. Um Ultimately, we took and we didn't even want to leave at six o'clock at seven. So we, he invited five or six or seven of them to dinner that night. And I said, oh, God, and I knew I had to report the next morning. Uh -huh. So we didn't get back to uh, we were, oh, Troy, Michigan. It was Troy, Michigan. We didn't get back to Troy till about 10 or 11 that night. And we had this report to do the next morning. And he said, let's get to it. And it was he and I, it was late at night. We put this handwritten report together and it was handwritten. There's the whole budget analysis of the performance of the operating division from the quarter before. And I got in, probably got home at two o'clock in the morning, slept for a few hours, took a shower, made the presentation to the CFO and the group president at the time. And the group president said, why, why is this handwritten report? And Chuck looked at him and said, we were out recruiting MBA students and I told Lou this was more important. And this, the CEO looked at it and said, he's absolutely right. Wow. Report. And just to give you a sense, we hired six of seven of those. We made seven offers. Six accepted the job. Every single one of those people either became a CEO or VP of finance of a major corporation within 10 years. Every one of them. Wow. So it was a great experience. But not only the... Chuck, my boss, who was the number two guy in the financial department, the CFO and the CEO ultimately became the chairman of a Fortune 100 company, said exactly the same thing. And that's why it was a handwritten report. And he he bought into it. So I had some real good lessons understanding the importance of talent as I was growing up and some great exposure. So that was that was the truth. Now, the sad part of that story. So let me bring it home. I'm on a plane with my wife. Uh, writing the introduction, the first edition of Hire With Your Head. So it had to be 1995, 96. And the story happened in 1972. And as I'm writing this story, I start crying. And my wife is sitting there, what, what's going on? I said, read this. My boss, Chuck, passed away of cancer when he was 40 years old. Four oh, years man. before that. Those words are going to live on, man. And, and just to just to drive this point home, and I think it's a great place to, to land this plane right now, is that, you know, that's true. Hiring great talent comes first. Everything else can wait. 
And if you're thinking about what you just said earlier, that the mission matters, if I can just talk to the recruiters and the staffing professionals that are out there watching this, that's your mission. That's exactly what you do for your clients every single day is you hire great talent. And it is the most important thing that any company can do. Everything else can wait. So the contribution that you're making in the world to your clients and to the candidates that you're representing is the mission. It matters. Your work matters. And you should stay connected to it. You should follow the wisdom of Lou Adler. Lou, thank you so much for being here. I know you've got an amazing book, Hire With Your Head, uh, top 10 Amazon bestseller. If you're watching this, you should definitely go out and get a copy of that. But if they want to engage with you, what's the best way to get a hold of you, Lou? Well, I think the best way is uh, if you go to hirewithyourhead.com, that's really what it is. We carry a book club, which has got contact information. That's the easy way to get it. You don't have to buy the book to, to join the book club, but we talk about a lot of this kind of stuff. But I also want to thank you, Dan. You just summarized that whole story so effectively and taken that idea and converted it into the mission of a recruiter. That was excellent, well stated, and I really appreciate you capsulizing that whole story that way because I think it's that's a message that gets lost. So thank you for doing that as well. My pleasure, man. Glad to have you here. I'm sure I'm going to be asking for you to come back on the show in future episodes cool. just to just to get that wisdom out to the community. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Have a great day.